Thanks a lot. Uh, we're about to start up. And uh, first we have um, the, uh, re really, the, the state-of-the-art and progressive radio host. He doesn't want me to say a lot about him, so I won't. Uh, Mr. Jay Diamond. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm just going to introduce you now. And uh, next we have Vanity Fair columnist and America's favorite British contrarian. He wields a crowded kebab skewer displaying the charred likes of Ronald Reagan, Henry Kissinger, Mother Teresa, and Bill Clinton. He was recently voted the world's fifth top public intellectual by Prospect Magazine. Hitchens has written over 60 books and is the proud enemy of all religions. <laughs> Abandoning most of his comrades on the left, Hitchens vehemently supports Bush's war in Iraq. His latest books are Love, Poetry, and War and Thomas Jefferson. He's got a new book coming out, I think, in early 2006 called God is Not Great, The Case Against Religion. And uh, th that's coming in early 2006. Um, so, uh, Christopher, please join us. He doesn't want to be named, but somebody out there in the crowd was very nice to drive all of these people up here, and we, uh, we literally couldn't have done this with you because of the strike. Thank you. You know who you are. Um, next, we're, we have uh, Scott Ritter. He's the uh, straight-talking former Marine officer who the CIA wants to silence. Um, he, he, he considers himself, or he still considers himself a Reagan Republican, um, although he did vote for Kerry. And um, he, uh, he, was, he served in Desert Storm. He was right-hand guy to Norman Schwarzkopf. And um, he, in Iraq, he found himself in a dangerous game between Iraq and the U.S. regimes. In 2000, Ritter wrote that Iraq had no milita militarily significant stocks of prohibited weapons. He strongly opposes Bush's war on Iraq. His new book is Iraq Confidential from Nation Books. Scott Ritter. Thank you. All right, does this Scott's work? Scott's going to start us off. Yeah, he's going to start us off. I still like Randy Critico's Jack Nicholson imitation. Maybe he'll come back yes. out. It wasn't. <laughs> okay, Randy did do a great job. But now we'll sober up. And why don't we start off? Why Iraq? Scott Ritter. Well, why Iraq? First of all, thank you very much for uh, giving me the honor and privilege for being here tonight to engage in uh, a much needed discussion, debate, and dialogue about Iraq. Um, contrary to the polarization in America today, Iraq is not a black and white issue. It's a deeply complicated issue, one that is uh, composed of many different shades of gray. Um, having said that, I'll state right off the bat that I am opposed to this war as much as one can possibly be opposed to this war. I am not a pacifist. I'm a former Marine. I spent 12 years as a commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps, and I've gone to war for my country. I'm somebody who knows what war is, and I understand why we fight. And when I take all of this accumulated belief foundation that I have, and I apply it to the situation we find ourselves in Iraq today, I find that I cannot come up with any justification worthy of a single American life as to why we should be in Iraq today. There are many reasons that can be presented. Indeed, I myself have articulated a number of potential justifications for American involvement in Iraq that would lead to regime change of the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. But again, I must reflect on the process that got us involved in this war. You know, we don't get to rewrite history. I know some people are trying to. Many of the proponents for this war have said, let's not talk about how we got there, why we got there. That's water under the bridge. Let's instead focus on the fact that we are there and how do we determine where we are going. I will tell you this, as a, an intelligence officer who spent 12 years wrestling with difficult issues, including trying to solve difficult problems, you can't solve a problem until you first define the problem. Any solution void of a definition is no solution at all, because what it is you're trying to solve. On the case of Iraq, we must take a look at how we got there. That is the foundation of our involvement. 
And ladies and gentlemen, it is as corrupt a foundation as you can possibly imagine. When I speak of war in Iraq, let's personalize it for a second. Let's speak of 161,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are over there serving their nation, our nation. They're ours. They belong to us. They wear our uniform. On their shoulder, our flag is sewn. And they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our Constitution. This is what we must focus on. They're not there to die for Iraqis. They're not there to die for anything other than the Constitution of the United States of America. That's the oath they took to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What is the Constitution? Why is it so important? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a document that defines who we are and what we are as a nation, as a people. A nation of laws. The rule of law is absolute, which means due process is absolute. You'll have people today talking about, we're there for democracy. We're there to build a nation. But let's talk about the case that was made. Because the case that was made by President George W. Bush for war in Iraq had nothing to do whatsoever with bringing democracy to the Iraqi people. It had nothing to do with liberating Iraq. It had everything to do with one thing, weapons of mass destruction chemical weapons, biological weapons, long-range ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons. The president said he knew they were there. He said this without any possibility of there being an alternative reality. The vice president said there could be no doubt that these weapons are there. This implies not that they're guessing, but that they're in possession of the facts. It implies certainty of knowledge. And yet, when called upon to produce this evidence, they could do no better than to gin up a national intelligence estimate that has, been turn that has turned out to be not only highly politicized, but 100 percent wrong. All they could do is get Colin Powell to appear before the Security Council of the United Nations and issue a speech, the totality of which has been proven wrong. He wasn't right on one thing. And yet, we went to war. A war again, that was about weapons of mass destruction. This is a fact that is put forward in the letter sent by John Negroponte, the, then the U.S. Ambassador of the United Nations, to the Security Council, saying that American troops have entered Iraq because Iraq has failed to comply with its obligation to disarm, and that international law dictates that America takes the lead in responding to this crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, international law dictated no such thing. International law dictated that the Security Council remain seized of the event, that the Security Council would once again have to pass a Chapter 7 resolution, which it did not. The United States invaded Iraq in violation of international law, but more importantly, in violation of the Constitution of the United States of America, Article 6 of which is quite clear, that when the United States of America enters into a treaty or international obligation that's been ratified by two-thirds United States Senate, that is the supreme law of the land. Our troops took an oath to uphold and defend that Constitution, and yet they went to war in violation of that Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, this is about as un-American a war as one can possibly imagine, and we must register that fact when we talk about why we're there and where we're going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. We are going to hear from Christopher Hitchens, but let me just make certain everybody remembers. Then what I'm going to do is encourage these fellows to talk to each other, and later still we'll take questions from the audience, so you might want to ponder what you're going to ask. But Christopher, I'm sure that provided plenty of grist. Well, yes, and also an admirable model of terseness, which I'll have to try and follow. Um, I'd like to say, and will try, um, I'd like to say first that it's a great a pleasure for me and far more natural to be arguing this case against a, a right-winger and a conservative. The argument really in Washington, my hometown, has always been between those of us who favor taking the risk of regime change um, and those who don't. And uh, since the opinions of um, Ramsey Clark and Michael Moore don't weigh very much in Washington circles, the main argument has always been uh, with a certain faction of the right, actually with two factions. 
the isolationist anti-Semitic forces grouped around Patrick Buchanan, and the so-called realists. Uh